All right, welcome everybody. I'm Mike Hirschberg. I'm the executive director of the Vertical Flight Society. Uh, just to uh, begin with, uh, you can see the URL there at the top. So I've uploaded these charts to our uh, website. Uh, so you can uh, take a picture. Um, instead of taking a picture, you can download them. Um, I have a lot more detail in here than I'm gonna go into. So this is sort of a uh, quick tour through the latest advances in, in uh, kind of next generation vertical flight. Um, activities. So how many people here are familiar with VFS or AHS? Or who's not, I guess who's not familiar? Okay. So we were formed in 1943 as the American Helicopter Society. Uh, really just as Sikorsky was getting their first contract for producing uh, helicopters and they realized that they, it was bigger than just them with the other, uh, with the Army and the other um, uh, companies, they all needed to band together and help to uh, develop this new vertical flight aircraft and, and produce it so that it had operational effectiveness and, and capability for both military and civil customers and um, try and help with this burgeoning new technology and, and, and uh, get it out in, in the hands of operators. So for the last 76, uh, and now uh, 77 years, uh, we've been working on that, uh, kind of that vision of collaborating, working together to advance technology and uh, get improved capabilities in the field. Uh, we have a long history of advocacy, so we've uh, done major support for programs like the V-22 Osprey, uh, the F-35 uh, Stovall Strike Fighter, uh, and today uh, with Future Vertical Lift uh, and Electric VTOL, we're continuing that legacy uh, and doing a lot of really, uh, uh, we're we've been very successful in the activities that we've uh, undertaken to support those activities. Uh, so I don't have much on pure helicopters, uh, but every year I typically give uh, the forecast. Uh, we work with Forecast International, uh, and this is uh, on the top row. Uh, and again, you'll be able to download these, but the, on, the, on the right side, this is uh, what it says. Basically, over the next uh, several years, uh, there's about 25% increase in uh, units delivered, expected, uh, but because aircraft are getting more and more expensive, more and more capable, basically larger aircraft than, than today's smaller, less expensive uh, helicopters are expected to be bought. So some of that is things like the uh, 609 civil tilt rotor, uh, as, as well as larger uh, super mediums uh, and things like that that are going to be uh, seen to be uh, expanding and uh, increasing in production. Uh, military aircraft, though, and this includes future vertical lift, uh, that's seen to, that is uh, predicted to, to continue to decline over the next decade. In the 2030s, uh, it'll pick up again with, uh, with as uh, future vertical lift uh, becomes uh, goes into production, and I'll talk about that a little bit more as far as the uh, the, the different strains. So the U.S. has really the the best helicopters uh, in the world for, uh, for their military. Uh, but they're really the latest uh, upgrades of designs that were created and, and, and uh, developed in the 60s and 70s. Um, and a lot of the old aircraft are even still, still flying. So aircraft are A models and they're brought back and they're upgraded, you know, sometimes B, C, D, uh, and E and F. The, um, 53K is an all-new aircraft, but still the same basic kind of architecture of the 1960s uh, 53A. Uh, so uh, the military recognized that there's, this was an issue that um, just like going from a, a flip phone to a smartphone, there's a whole new uh, capability set that's possible if you, if you do a next generation uh, uh, system. And so in uh, 2008, uh, after several years of, of work that we had done on Capitol Hill, uh, the um, Congress directed the, the Pentagon to start the Future Vertical Lift Program. Uh, so today, so uh, 12 years later, um, Bell and Sikorsky Boeing have built two demonstrators under the Joint uh, Multi-World Technology Program, uh, GMR. These are in approximately the 30,000 pound uh, class. So government gave each team about uh, $100 million and they each put in about four times that much. So about a billion dollars has gone into the, the JMR program. Uh, and you can see on the top right, that's sort of the operational concept which uh, would, would be 
uh, a system that uh, the Sikorsky Boeing team envisioned uh, producing for uh, both utility on the top uh, uh, top section there and then an attack version. So sort of like the, the Huey and Cobra um, uh, approach. Uh, below is their demonstrator. This is actually a few months ago, but uh, they've actually had, I think they had their 10th flight uh, last week. Uh, they've flown up to, um, I think, 100 knots, so they're starting to make more progress. Uh, the goal of the air, of the uh, these programs are, are to fly uh, well over 200 knots, and even more important than the speed is the long range. Um, as uh, as battlefields become uh, more and more standoff for where they base the troops, they're going to have more and more long range capability. So every couple years, the army changes the names of the programs, so it gets a little bit hard to follow. Uh, but sort of kind of the uh, capability sets, they had five uh, capability sets, so they don't really use these terms anymore, but it still kind of uh, aligns with how it was. But there's a FARA, which is a future attack reconnaissance aircraft. Uh, so this is a, a relatively high speed around or the, on the order of uh, 200 knots, uh, longer range, and but the idea is to get this fielded as, as quickly as possible. So by 2028, to actually have uh, systems that they, they could be operationally used. Um, the capability set three, which was what the JMR was based on, is now the future long-range assault aircraft. Um, and uh, the, the Marines are looking at uh, attack utility replacement aircraft. So each of these uh, three different uh, programs underway all rhyme. And it's really difficult when you have FARA, FLORA, and ARA to, rem to figure out which one you guys are, t which one are talking about. So it, the crutch of having CS this and CS that is a little more difficult. Uh, but at the same time, the Navy is also now beginning a program, uh, and it's not clear. I put it here as, as the medium capability set uh, two class. It could be based on the FLORA or it could be ARA, uh, but probably not FARA if you got that. Uh, so the point is, uh, you know, over a billion dollars has been spent just in the demonstrators today, and industry has proven that they can really do a next generation, a leap ahead te technology uh, over a conventional helicopter. So based on those demonstrations, now they're competing for um, this, uh, the, the FARA, the lightweight uh, attack um, reconnaissance aircraft, um, and also starting now for a procurement for uh, a competition for the, the, the FLORA. So it's really pretty incredible to have two of these programs that are underway almost simultaneously. Um, and so the Army has really uh, moved a lot of, um, you know, gotten a lot of, um, moved a lot of money and gotten a lot of uh, um, agreement within the service or a command within the service of to execute these, these two programs. Uh, so this is the, uh, I showed before, the SB-1 de Defiance, of course, again, Boeing. It's, I think it flew its 10th flight last week. Um, so they originally flew in March of uh, 2019, had some different issues. Uh, so haven't, they haven't flown that much, uh, but they're now really starting to make some progress with that. Uh, the V-280 uh, Valor flew in December of 2017, so it's been flying for uh, over two years. Um, I think more than, uh, I think more than, uh, let's see, they've, they've flown over 300 knots, um, over 300 nautical miles, uh, and something like, I don't know, 300 flights or something like that. So they've, they've done a lot of demonstrations uh, with it, a lot, shown a lot of capability. And they also did a demonstration uh, last month where they're showing that they could uh, fly autonomously. Um, so the idea is in the future you could have things that are autonomously and that are autonomous and maybe even unmanned. So the FARA program here, you can see there's, uh, there's five competitors for this at the t uh, now. They're going to down-select uh, another month or two uh, to two aircraft to go into advanced design, and then one aircraft, I think, to actually uh, build it and demonstrate it. Uh, these are the, the, the five competitors. Boeing hasn't released what they're doing. They're probably doing some sort of um, compound uh, helicopter. Uh, but these are all concepts. Now, the, on the top right there, the Raider, uh, the Raider X is based on this aircraft, the Raider, the S-97, that they've been flying for, um, for several years, uh, but it's got to be much bigger so th than this one. So the Raider is really optimized for higher speeds, uh, and what the Army said is, well, we don't really need such a, so much higher speeds. We really want, really want something that's a little bit lower cost uh, and a little bit larger. So it, 
Sikorsky does have something flying that they can demonstrate the technology and things like that, um, but it's not a, it's not, a, it's not, the way they flew is not a perfect fit for what the Army is looking for. So everybody's going to have some development required uh, for the next phase. Just as a comparison here for uh, tilt rotors and compounds, uh, size comparison between the demonstrators, oops, uh, the rotor, and then uh, the, what we know for tilt rotors on the right side, uh, gives, it, gives a, um, a view of what the different size classes are. Uh, on the civil side, the 609 is now hopefully going to be uh, certified this year. The fourth aircraft, or um, their first production aircraft or pre-production aircraft, is now uh, in flight testing. They've done a lot of work on icing and other things. So hopefully this year we'll see uh, the entry into service for the, the 609. Uh, Leonardo is also looking at a larger uh, aircraft, uh, next generation civil tilt rotor that's funded under Clean Sky. Um, this is, I think, a 19-passenger uh, aircraft that's uh, supposed to be in the 2020 time frame. They're actually taking a 609 and modifying it uh, to demonstrate some of the different uh, technologies that, uh, that, that would be required for the uh, NGCTR. So things like the non-tilting engines, uh, a, a V-tail, a uh, different kind of wing, and, and a number of other type of sort of internal technologies. Uh, that they think this will have a, a good benefit when they scale it up for a more um, uh, a larger capacity tow rotor. Uh, Airbus, on the other hand, is actually building their racer, and I think they're supposed to fly here in the next year or so. Um, so th both of them have different approaches, but it also maybe shows you the, the difference in the complexity of designing and um, flying a tow rotor compared to a, a compound helicopter. So. Uh, our magazine, VertiFlight, um, tries to cover the latest advances in technology, and, and particularly uh, vehicle technology. And uh, we've got some copies in the back, so if you, if you haven't seen the latest issue, uh, please uh, grab one on your way out. Uh, but we've been highlighting different, different advances. So 10 years, we've been covering future vertical lift. Uh, for six or seven years, we've been cover covering uh, electric VTOL or urban air mobility. And uh, we try to provide the, the latest insights on what's going on. And as media, uh, you can get access for free as, uh, as, as complimentary members. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but I'm going to talk now a bit about electric VTOL. So we call it the re electric VTOL revolution because we see it really as transformative as things like the, the turbine engine, uh, going from pistons to turbines or uh, analog cockpits to glass cockpits on how much things have changed. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Sorry. But it's not really, uh, urban air mobility or UAM is not synonymous with EV tall. So electric propulsion frees up so much uh, design capability, uh, everything from Amazon packages, uh, personal flying devices, uh, large cargo uh, transports, um, inter intra and intercity and, and regional uh, transport. So UAM, there's a panel tomorrow afternoon I'll talk about, but uh, it's not it's not just it's not synonymous with the technology, and the technology is eVTOL. So um, eVTOL electric uh, ultralights are already flying. So you know we've proven that that this is a capability at the smaller scale. They're working through some of the different issues with batteries and um, uh, safety and things like that. Uh, I think Opener and Kitty Hawk have both flown over 20,000 flights apiece. Um, a lot of them there have flown, um, Opener's flown a lot of uh, unmanned flights. Um, but they're really kind of proving out the basics and, and learning from them, as well as how to navigate some of the restrictions with, with the regu regulations. But these are probably going to be something like a fun uh, recreational thing, uh, sort of like jet skis or, or um, snowmobiles, where you can go out and have a lot of, a lot of fun. Uh, but because of the regulations, they're really restricted in, in not being able to do, not being able to use for uh, air taxi or, or commercial purposes. But over the last uh, few weeks, uh, last uh, three weeks, I guess, uh, a lot of really exciting stuff has happened. So at CES, uh, Bell unveiled, unveiled their latest version of their um, of their electric taxi, uh, and I'll talk about it in a minute. But um, they're partnered with with Uber. Uh, who's uh, really done a lot of leadership activities in, in pushing forward on air taxi concepts. Uh, Hyundai also announced that they're partnered with Uber and they unveiled a full-scale mock-up as well. 
but really more important uh, and more revolutionary is uh, Joby Aviation. So they've been working for about 10 years on this electric, uh, basically tilt propeller aircraft. Um, and in, on December 20th, they announced that they had uh, partnered with Uber. So it was sort of this marriage of the, the world's leading taxi service uh, that had been really pushing and leading activities for um, electric air taxis with a leading aircraft developer. So that, that was really a tremendous uh, milestone. And then uh, two weeks ago, uh, they announced that Toyota, who had, who had already invested uh, almost, almost $100 million in and Joby already uh, added another $400 million. So between all of their investors, it's uh, $720 million now of, of investment. So that's, that really says something about uh, not, not, only, not only the company, but also the, the vision for air taxi service uh, in the future. So I mentioned Uber Elevate. So uh, this was unveiled actually at one of our workshops in, in 2016. They came out with a white paper. They have annual summits. Uh, and they're not developing a, an aircraft. Uh, they're trying to use their big data and leadership in helping to inspire or, um, or create an ecosystem of all the different players. So this is working with regulators, uh, cities, real estate companies, um, EV, uh, electric vehicle charging companies, things like that, and, and trying to get public opinion and things like that uh, all working together to, to give birth to this revolutionary capability. Uh, they announced in 2016 that they are planning flight tests in 2020 uh, and operational service in 2023. And this was like so radical. Uh, it was like these guys are lunatics, but they're actually on, on, on track for that. So uh, Joby and, and possibly another couple of companies may, um, are, are, I'll say, are, are, have a good chance of being certified by uh, 2023 to support that, that launch time. And this is very different from electric helicopters. So this is the Sikorsky Firefly project from, uh, from 10 years ago. Uh, and this just shows on the floor, if you take out uh, the stuff you need for mechanical drive systems and combustion, what you get for, uh, what you can take out of the aircraft. So that's just, that's just the combustion system. But really the real advantage of eVTOL is getting rid of the complex and very expensive um, psychic collective swash blade, all the rotor systems. Uh, the engine, the transmission, gearboxes, shafting, hydraulics. And the idea is to take this relatively uh, uh, critical and expensive uh, single thruster uh, with lots of smaller uh, thrusters and distribute those around the aircraft. Especially with a wing, then you can uh, have much better efficiency uh, for speed and longer range. And because there's no um, combustion on board, you get rid of the large uh, impulsive noise from a uh, from a rotor system, you can have it much quieter, and there's no tailpipe emissions. So depending on how you generate your electricity, you could be reduced or possibly even zero emissions. So why now? So there's all these advancements in electric motors and batteries. I mean, you look at your cell phone and how much battery power that has improved over the, over the years. Uh, computer modeling simulation used to be kind of more the domain of the large OEMs and the government, and now there's commercially available packages that, that people can can buy and use. So there's this democratization of, um, of computer modeling uh, software, obviously advances in, uh, in composites, low-cost manufacturing, things like uh, 3D printing, um, just really amazing stuff. Uh, I was at Joby and showed me a really unbelievable uh, 3D printed titanium part that was, anyway, it's pretty amazing. Um, so this changed to performance regulations. So with Part 23, Amendment 64, that came out a few years ago. So now uh, it's much more, you know, you need to meet industry standards uh, rather than, you know, so much specificity on exactly what everything needs to do. And I think people are just more interested and, and open to technology. If you want to be, you know, early adopters and cutting edge, so people are more interested in, in technology innovations. And uh, it's really interesting because, um, you know, traditionally money that's gone into developing uh, aircraft has either come from the government, uh, typically, typically military investments, or from the companies themselves. Uh, so, you know, Boeing or um, Airbus or somebody wants a new aircraft, and they spend the, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars or whatever to, to get to design this and, and, and get it out as a product. And now with the app economy, something like over a trillion dollars is made by you know, Apple and Google and uh, the, you know, PayPal and all the different uh, um, app types of um, 
you know, the Silicon, Silicon Valley types of, of um, new tech. Uh, and people that made all that money, they want to do, do something with it. They can either invest in another company and, and, and make more money, or they can look at something about uh, society's problems and maybe how to uh, Im improve those. So it's really a confluence of all these different uh, capabilities. But, you know, is this uh, EV tall revolution going to succeed? Well, I mean, bottom line is you have to make more money than do doing anything else uh, that, that's competing with it. Um, so I mentioned about, about more about batteries. You know, there's this drone revolution where the military kept trying to develop drones, and then, you know, China uh, cornered 95% of the market or whatever by having low-cost, really producible uh, um, types of, of aircraft. So you look at the numbers there as far as number of registrations. Um, you know, Tesla was crazy. They wanted to do an electric car, and now they've you know they're leading EV car EV car company. And um, you know now every every car company has an electric vehicle. And as mentioned about the just you know your cell phone or your laptop com today compared to uh, what it was you know 10 or 20 years ago. So because we talked before about some of the costs, some of the expensive things that come out, uh, then the aircraft are, are fundamentally, by first principles, going uh, to be uh, cheaper to build and, and even uh, operate. Uh, and with, if you can get higher production rates, then obviously it's a virtuous cycle where you can have uh, lower costs still. Not at, not at uh, automotive uh, um, rates of you know, hundreds of thousands, but maybe uh, thousands or tens of thousands. And with the expectation that these will have be much uh, lower noise, they'll be able to operate uh, in higher density locations, and be able to do kind of shuttles all day, every day, uh, back and forth um, to keep that throughput uh, and um, service up. So just to wrap it up, kind of there's this uh, potential for a step change, what we call this uh, EV tall revolution, uh, in, a, in utilization versus a helicopter, for example, and improved cost, noise, and speed. But there's lots of challenges. I've, I've got kind of five here, five key challenges. Uh, so there is a technology uh, I've showed before. There's kind of, you know, ultralights can fly enough for one person. Some uh, larger aircraft have been flying, such as Joby, that's uh, five passengers. Uh, but, you know, getting up to that larger scale um, is difficult because you need the latest, you know, you need the best technology that's available today. There's also the infrastructure. So. Um, heliports don't have the charging facilities right, and they're maybe not located where you'd want to operate these because helicopters are noisy, so they're not allowed in the city center. So moving them to higher density uh, areas, uh, allowing their use, and, and of course, the air traffic management, uh, avoiding other traffic, allowing them to operate, keeping unmanned traffic away from them. There's uh, a huge uh, workforce shortage, so uh, pilots in, uh, or there's a pilot shortage and, and people maintainers and such for the helicopter industry. Uh, and even more so, it's going to be if you're, if you're operating and, and flying tens of thousands of eVTOL aircraft. Uh, you know, people need to be trained to fly them. They need to be trained to maintain them. Uh, so there, there's a, a whole lot of workforce development required for that. Um, as well as engineering forces, uh, you know, all this, these billions of uh, dollars of uh, military future vertical lift programs, in addition to the existing, you know, civil programs and things like that, you know, that's going to need thousands of engineers. And then you have, if you want to have thousands of EV tall aircraft, and that's, you know, tens of thousands maybe of engineers. So there's pilot shortage, probably a workforce shortage in general. And particularly for pilots, eventually, you know, they're going to be you know, five or ten years are going to be more and more autonomous or completely autonomous. So you got to find a lot of pilots, and then you got got to get rid of them all. So um, there's that whole, um, you know, how do you do that all that workflow as well? Uh, standards and regulations, uh, they these are in develop in development. Uh, so Jay Merkel from um, uh, from the FAA uh, said um, a couple weeks ago that there's six urban air mobility aircraft are in advanced stages of development. You didn't say which one, so I don't know if those are all EV tall or maybe some of the UAM ones are EC tall aircraft, but you know, they, they're comfortable with this, uh, this development that, they, that the FAA has the, the, the certification uh, standards and regulations that'll be there in probably 2023 time frame is what we expect uh, to be able to introduce these into service. 
and then public acceptance. Sure, these will be you know, much quieter than helicopters, but they're not quieter than nothing. So if there's not a vertiport there already, and you're going to fly hundreds of them in and out every day, they'll be noisier than what was there. Uh, Uber and other developers uh, believe that they'll be quieter uh, than the background noise traffic of the, of the area, but also people seeing them. There is the uh, visual pollution of seeing uh, aircraft uh, flying around all the day, all day, just like if there were drones. Uh, so, you know, these different things, and people believe that uh, eVTOL are just inherently safer because there's lots of thrusters. It's not necessarily the case. You still have to do the, the whole safety um, analysis and everything for that. They, they could be safer, uh, but not, inher not necessarily inherently so. And against all these, these five key challenges is this rush to be the first to market. Uh, and so that counters, or that, that makes it even more difficult. We, you know, I think any one of us could say, yeah, you know, 20 years, this will probably be good. But, you know, these things I'm sure can all be worked out. But, you know, in, in three years, can it be done in three years? That's kind of the issue. Uh, so we have a website, uh, evtall.news. Uh, we started this uh, several years ago. And uh, so we were trying to keep track of all the different evtall aircraft. Uh, I counted them last night, so it's uh, 252. Uh, and then we broke them down into different versions, whether it's got wings or not, or it's got a rotor and stuff like that. Uh, a couple examples here. I mean, this is a Chinese design. This is actually like a quarter scale model um, uh, test aircraft. And then uh, on the bottom right is uh, Lilium Jet, which is on the cover of our magazine. So it's sized for five seats. Uh, they've done some, tr some transitions for forward flight as they've been flying it unmanned. Uh, but we've been trying to keep track of this. Um, we've have, we have uh, also on the website, we've got articles uh, going back, uh, I think, six years. Uh, so we've been, we've been tracking this for a while and trying to, to give the context. Um, so some people, some, some eVTOL concepts have come out over the years, and it's like, wow, somebody just invented a quadcopter that you can sit in, and that's like, gonna, that's like, that's the answer. It's like, no, I mean, you got to look at the context of all the stuff going on, and just because that company got a lot of good press for some reason, that's not necessarily that not necessarily that, that was a good design or the or the best design, um, or even a likely design. Uh, we also have a lot of uh, online resources, and and these are all again we're trying to educate the the, the media, trying to educate the public, the the um, people working in this area. So we have lots of different um, resources. We've got a lot of uh, videos. We have uh, we'll be we're already recording this presentation like we've done the last several years. Um, we also have other um, other resources you can see there. So, um, so I've been briefing here this uh, annual Future of Vertical Flight press conference, I think since 2012, uh, kind of showing what's going on in civil military. In the last, I think, four years, four or five years, I've been talking about uh, eVTOL. So we actually, uh, uh, three years ago, in 2018, we had the um, Electric VTOL Revolution panel. So we had leaders from Bell and U Uber, uh, Gamma, FAA, uh, last year, um, uh, Vertical Magazine uh, helped with that. Alon Head, she, she moderated. Again, we had Bell, Airbus, uh, Safran, Helijet, um, Rex Alexander, who's a consultant for ours for infrastructure, and Nexa. Um, and so we were planning on something along the lines again this year, but then we found out that HAI was going to have the same speakers. So that you've got Airbus, Bell, FAA, Uber, and Nexa again. Um, and I really encourage all of you guys to come to this uh, tomorrow afternoon, uh, uh, 1 to 3. Um, you can see some of the level of the, of the, the folks here. Um, and I think it'll be a good discussion to present at more broader terms of what UAM is and why you guys should care about it. Uh, but So because of this, we've, we created a complimentary uh, panel specifically looking at acoustics. Um, so we've got some of the experts uh, from uh, Joby, Hyundai, uh, Department of Transportation's uh, Volpe, uh, Juliet Page is leading the, uh, the a HAI uh, Fly Neighborly, well it used to be a committee, but they renamed to working groups, um, and, and Uber, um, and Jim Sherman from Vertical Flight Society, and, and really talk about why these are different. It's, you know, why fundamentally, just from the basic f physics, these will be much quieter than, uh, than helicopters. Uh, we just had last week uh, the largest, the longest running and largest uh, eVTOL conference uh, in the world. So we had almost 500 uh, attendees. We had exhibitors, sponsors. This was in uh, San Jose, 
uh, last week. So was, we had a transformative vertical flight event. So we had about uh, 60 technical papers presented and about 60 VIP, you know, plenary uh, invited speakers. Um, and it was really a great, uh, a great gathering of people that both from the established technical folks and the innovators. And I had a lot of people telling me that it was such a fantastic conference, best conference I've ever attended in my life, kinds of things. Um, and so we have this every year. Next year it'll be in the Phoenix area. Uh, but we're also, we've also been doing a series of workshops where we actually get down and look for work on solutions, understand the, the key areas of, of um, the key challenges such as infrastructure that we're working on with the FAA's tech center. Um, it'll be, it's, it's kind of between Atlantic City and Philadelphia, closer to the Philadelphia side. Um, but we're trying to, you know, we want to get the architectural firms, the city planners, uh, utilities to understand what's coming. This is a huge opportunity for cities that are struggling with, um, with um, co congestion, road congestion, things like that, uh, to be able to look for and design a smart city for the future. And press is, is, uh, in, you know, press is welcome to attend that. Also want to highlight something. Uh, so we're a sponsor. We were one of the um, supporters for the launch of the GoFly Prize several years ago. Uh, they're now having their they're now having their final fly off at uh, on Leap Day, February 29th, uh, in, at NASA Ames. So this is a personal flying device. So it's the minimum size you could have for a vehicle that can get you off the ground, and it's uh, fly 20 miles or 20 minutes uh, near vertical takeoff and landing, but be really quiet. So uh, you know we've seen jet packs, rocket packs since the 50s and 60s. Uh, but they're really noisy. So how can you have something that has a long, you know, relatively long endurance, is quiet, um, and some actual capability? So that'll be exciting uh, here at the end of uh, end of February. Also, our uh, 76th annual forum is in Montreal this year. So this is about 1,400 attendees typically. It's, it's, so it's uh, the rotorcraft technical community. So folks from NASA, uh, Army, the CEOs of the different helicopter uh, OEMs. Uh, and we have about 250 technical papers, as well as uh, about 75 panelists and exhibitors. Uh, we're also doing a short course on eVTOL and, and a tour of Bell Canada. Um, so this is a, a, the big culmination for the, the, technical, um, the technical community every year. And just as a retrospective, uh, so you know, in 1944, we had our first uh, banquet. Uh, you can see Igor Sikorsky in the back, some of the other early pioneers, a lot of military uh, during World War II. And then 70 years later, we had our first uh, eVTOL workshop. You see some of the leaders of, of uh, Uber and um, uh, uh, Joby and, and other companies, uh, Piasecki, NASA, uh, Kitty Hawk, that, are, that were in that first, first meeting, the world's first technical meeting on, on eVTOL, and are really the leaders of, of the industry today. And, and finally, it's just important to remember like where we are, all right? So in 2011, there was a first kind of prehistoric eVTOL aircraft where somebody actually got off the ground. So maybe that's like 1907 with the first helicopter kind of thing that got off the ground. And so today we're doing some uh, public demonstrations. I used Airbus and Volocopter as an example here, but it could have been anybody. Um, so, you know, there's public demonstrations, but it wasn't until another 30 years before there was an actual product, well, all right, so maybe you know, 10 years before there's an actual product, but you look at uh, you know, with, with turbine engines as things uh, kept increasing, got a much you know, better and better product over the, over the years. So you have something that's state of the art, H160 or other H uh, or um, Bell 525 or something like that. So th you shouldn't really handicap EV to all just because of where they are, but what the potential is for the future. So to wrap it up, uh, this again, I have all the slides here uh, posted on this URL. Um, like we've done in, in past years. Uh, so, you know, we're trying to do everything we can to help support the, the uh, future of vertical flight. There is billions of dollars going into new, advanced, uh, kind of next generation military and civil uh, rotorcraft. The, the big, uh, this will really be on display in May at our forum. Uh, there's our website, vtol.org. And as far as eVTOL, um, you know, there's uh, over $2 billion of investment that's gone in this area. Um, we're having workshops and doing everything we can to help support this. And, uh, you know, sort of like, like drones, the drone, drone revolution, we see this uh, happening to really uh, change society and, and change how we, how we, th how we th see things. And our website is uh, evtol.news. So with that, I'm happy to answer questions.
yeah, Tony Osborne with Aviation Week. What what gives you the impression? Well, what what, what, what do you know about the Boeing um, FARA options, and are, and are they looking for a partner? So I haven't heard anything about Boeing looking for a partner in FARA because the the proposals already went in. Uh, so the down select I think is going to be in, in February, and uh, you. I'm sorry, Flora. Flora, right? Yeah. So they haven't announced what they're doing. I mean, personally, uh, you know, at our forum 75, they had a, uh, a uh, they were showing the testing they had done on their um, compound Apache. So I, I'd imagine it's some something like, um, like uh, it's probably a compound, um, some sort of compound uh, attack helicopter. That's what I'm thinking. I wouldn't really say scaled down Apache, but it, because it's probably easier to build a new new design. Because um, you look at you know the 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 Bell 360. I mean, all these are really new designs. Even the Raider, it's based on kind of the uh, the Raider X is based loosely on the Raider, but it's a whole new aircraft. They've got maybe the most the, the best bases, but I think it's going to be something more like the the uh, the Bell 360, but a compound. And they also they were the developers of the the, the Comanche, for instance. Yeah, Mike, I'm sorry, Guy Norris from Aviation Week. Have you seen any reduction in the giggle factor yet? As some of these, you know, 250 type projects have sort of started to whittle down, or are you still seeing more and more coming out of the woodwork? Uh, so it's actually pretty amazing. It's been two per week for the last like two years. So you look, uh, you know, last year we had a press release right before, well, in January that we hit 150. This this year in January we hit 250. And the previous year when I was at um, our event, uh, we had, I think it was 54. So it's, it's two a week. I mean, very, very linear. Um, and th so the answer to your question, no, the ideas that are coming, some of the ideas that are coming out now are, are just as crazy or crazier than the ones that came out a couple of years ago. So, I mean, as an educational society, we're trying to say, um, you know, that's great. Uh, it's, you know, it's one thing to take, uh, you know, some drone propellers and stick them on a chair and say you got off the ground. But it's really, you don't have a design until you have a safety, uh, until you've designed the safety case for it. And it's got to be, you know, the, the design's not finished until, you have a, until you've looked at all the different f uh, failure mechanisms and things like that. So... People should not start from from drone from looking at a drone and scaling it up. It should be more looking at looking at it from a clean sheet of paper or more from the airplane perspective. Those two hundred and fifty are still active, are they? No. You, you are, or no. some of those disappeared. Yeah, yeah no. Um, so we keep track of everything. So if somebody says, "Well, what was what was the Joby S two? Well, we've got that one there. You know, what was uh, what was the Agusa Westland Project Zero? Um, it's on there. So. Um, there are some percent, um, I don't know, 10% maybe that are inactive. The other thing is uh, we track aircraft and not companies. So I did a count of the companies, um, I guess when we hit 250. So it's like 187 companies. I mean, we've got four different uh, Joby designs, four or five different Joby designs on there, for instance. Um, Airbus has, you know, Vahana and City Airbus. Um, they've finished Vahana. They may come out with a new design that's maybe a blend of the two. We'll see how, what they look for as a, as a project. Uh, Craig Schmidtman, aerospacenews.com. Um, you talked about the development of batteries. Uh, skeptics are saying that um, it appears that if the energy density of batteries looks like it's uh, quite a ways off for this to turn into something that's got real commercial applications. So hybridization uh, looks to be a near-term solution, but what has your organization uh, said publicly. Uh, I've missed it about, say, hydrogen as an, an alternative uh, energy storage technology. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I don't know that I say we've said much publicly, but um, uh, hydrogen, I think, is probably the, uh, appears to be a great long-term answer uh, in the future. Um, there are a couple companies now that are developing uh, and, and flying, well, developing hydrogen fuel cell technology and flying. I'm not sure they're actually flying them. Um, flying the hydrogen cells online on, uh, on board. So that's the Alakai, the Sky um, multi-copter. Um, so we really think that the breakthrough is this distributed electric propulsion. So when you can 
and I kind of look at it fly by wire, it's power by wire. So you, when you can dis distribute the thrust around the aircraft without all the gearboxes, drive shafts, and things like that that, that, would, that had been required in the 20th century, that that's really the key. And how you generate your electricity, if it's a hybrid electric or pure batteries or hydrogen or, or other technology, um, those, those, the advancement of those technologies or those, the application of those technologies for different missions um, those will, you know, hydrogen will make all this stuff much more economical, much more robust, I'll say. And one of the reasons why um, Uber set uh, five seats for, for, well, five seats, um, that was the maximum size that they thought they could do by noise, uh, that, that, that the noise that a, that a five-seat aircraft of this kind of weight would, would generate would be enough to blend into the background, but it's also kind of the, the, the ragged edge of what technology could produce. So, and, and that's one of the things I said before. So sort of we know in 2020, you know, we know in 20 years that this will have all kinds of great technology by then. It's really now how, you know, how, how mature is the technology to be able to have these, uh, I mean, Uber's looking at very short range kind of hops uh, that, might take an hour by, by car and 10 minutes by, by aircraft because you can hop over the traffic. And that's kind of the, the niche that they think they can exploit. So the issue with um, the need for flight hour costs to come down to make EV toll, you know, scalable and uh, profitable, um, what effect might that have on the helicopter market near term? I mean, obviously, we're not talking about supplanting helicopters totally when these things come online, but um, are the, o the existing OEMs responding to that and might there be sort of a race to the bottom that benefits everyone in rotorcraft? So most of the, well, I'd say all of the, the five big OEMs, including Boeing for us, um, they're all looking at um, eVTOL and they've all taken different approaches. So Bell obviously is you know, all in, they've got a hybrid electric design, a pure electric design, um, and as I mentioned before, with the, uh, the, the limitations of, of um, energy density for batteries, uh, they are kind of s limited. I mean, that, that five passengers is kind of the limit of, that you could reasonably expect in the next few years. Um, we do think it will eat up some of the existing uh, helicopter market, uh, just like drones did, but it didn't, you know, didn't put the helicopters out of business. There are certain missions that you can use, you can fly a drone much more economically than a helicopter, and and people should. Um, and it's just like this, if you've got uh, shorter range, um, it's also, you know, the, look where they're launching in Dallas, Los Angeles, and and Melbourne. So places where it doesn't rain, doesn't have bad weather. So I mean, it's pretty much they're going to be. Not really exper experimental, but um, you know, you, you don't want to you want to walk crawl, no crawl walk run, <laughs> and not walk crawl run. Um, so I think um, I think there will be some missions that heli I think I think there will be some missions that helicopters are doing today or can do today that they'll take over, but it'll mainly be adding missions that helicopters aren't good at, such as flying into downtown things like that that are too noisy or things like that. And there's a question over here. Hi, Carlos Ugarte from Aero Helicopters. Yeah, uh, along the lines of uh, what you've been talking about, um, like three years seems like a very short time frame before we actually get there in terms of safety, in terms of the economics, in terms of the, um, uh, the acceptance of the public. So, so how, how realistic and, and who are we really thinking about here? Is a helicopter really going to be the, uh, the, the first one out there? Um, or is there any, any other solution that we can seriously think it's going to be out there in three years? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Joby has been flying now for three years. Um, so they have a lot of uh, flight time on their first aircraft. Um, you've, you know, Airbus has gathered data with, uh, with Vahana. Um, you mentioned Volocopter, so they've flown, I don't know, thousand, I don't know, a lot of flights. Uh, but they're pretty limited by short range. So I think, you know, they're, and they're, uh, EASA took a very different approach for the certification standards. So they were actually coming out with totally different certification standards, so special condition VTOL, uh, and the, those, and that approach. FAA is like, no, they're really just fixed-wing aircraft, and we're just going to have sp stuff that addresses the electrical parts and addresses the vertical flight, vertical parts. So 
Uh, short answer is, I think in 2023, there will be some limited service as people, and actually air taxi service, so revenue service um, in different places around the world. Uh, but it's, it's going to be, you know, it's going to start out slow and, and I think build momentum over the next, you know, the next half dec decade and the decades to come. EV tolls for military use? Yeah, I mean, I could see it, you know, something that's very quiet that, you know, maybe it's small and can insert people or, you know, insert or ex extract people behind enemy lines, something like that. I think it'd be, um, you know, not very long range, but I think it'd be something that would be, could be very attractive. Um, the, the military is also looking at it from a, a different perspective. Uh, this was highlighted at our conference last week that, um, a lot of the components uh, and a lot of the investments are coming from China, which is, which complicates things for the military. So even though the first you know the first use cases are really these civil air taxi ones, well, eventually they're going to be bigger and bigger and have more capability, um, and they would prefer not to be you know by having such Chinese content and Chinese ownership. So that's. Uh, you you know, from our meeting last week, there's probably going to be more things, this agility prime and things like that that have come out about why the Air Force and other services are interested. Not so much for today, but maybe for the future. All right. Well, thank you very much.